We give you our hearts today, oh God. We lift our voice to you and say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Have your way among us, oh God. Thank you for your sweet presence already in this house, Lord. Hallelujah. As we were praying earlier, I just felt the, the spirit of the living God was moving like the currents in the air, in the, in the waters and the jet streams in the air, above and, and below and all around. The spirit of the living God is moving among his people right now. Wherever you are, his spirit is alive and accessible, and he's moving. And I pray that there would be a manifestation of the presence of God in the lives of the people that are gathered in his name today. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I am so thankful for all of my church family that's come here to make this day special. I give honor to you, to Pastor Walker, to my husband, and I give honor to the ladies of the Quebec District, their leadership under Sister Grant and the team. Thank you for allowing us to join together in worship with you today. You may be seated. In our last service, we talked about our story, but the title of that message was really, This is His Story. And we talked about a love story, and we touched just briefly on the song of the redeemed, and that is the subject of this service. The title of this message is, This is My Song. We talked about how God starts the music, and we sing back lyrics in response. I don't know about you, but I once chose a song on purpose to sing <laughs> with, and the, there was no starting notes. You just had to have your, your note out of thin air, and then the music came along. And if you weren't in the right spot, in the right key, you were messed up. There's a lot of people that think they're going to sing their song to Jesus like that. <laughs> well, I'll just start it in my key, in my timing, and see if that works out. Well, that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God, because this is his story, but this is our song. You and I as believers are called to sing a new song. And to the Lord. And today we're going to talk about that song, the song of the redeemed, and what I believe, above all else, that it's the song of a holy life. My song and your song that we sing back to the Lord is the song of a holy life. Three times in the Word of God, it's written, Worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. And one translation renders it this way Worship the Lord in the beauty of a holy life. Now, holy is one of those words that's hard to describe and explain, and people want parameters. And it's kind of like nailing jello on the wall, it's just hard to get it to stick. And uh, we, we don't really always have a clear understanding. So I just want to make it absolutely super simple, basis level meaning that I can give you. And that is being holy means being His. Being holy means being his. It means loving God back the way he loves us with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, with our inner person and our outer person, with our conduct and our character, even in kindness. As recipients of salvation, part of loving God is worshiping him in holiness, and that is a beautiful thing. It includes this new song. Sing a new song. 
unto the Lord. Now, all of us aren't songwriters. You, I've wrote some songs, and some of them are kind of corny. I, I won't even, I'll spare you. Not all of us are beautiful songwriters and lyricists, but we can write back a beautiful song to the Lord in the way that we love him back. The scripture talks about the song of the redeemed, and these songs are, are composed, are, are, are they created with just words and melodies that are sung with our mouths, or do they refer to something more than music? Could perhaps the lyrics of the new song, your new song and my new song, be exhaled with every breath that we live in his presence? As our lives are lived out, are they sweet refrains that are drifting heavenward and acceptable sacrifice, true worship? Our worship tells the story of God's love, and I love to worship, and I believe there's power in worship. I could preach a message or two even about the delivering power of worship, but our worship does more than just tell the story. Worship lives out the story of God's love. The Bible is this epic narrative. We talked about his unfolding plan, the plan of God over the course of history and the world, and it tells of those who have been redeemed, those that are delivered from evil, from death, hell, and the grave because of their obedience to the gospel, repenting, being baptized, and being filled with the Spirit of God. The redeemed who have experienced that new birth by turning from their old way and turning towards God and being cleansed and restored and filled with the Spirit of God, they know that God himself put the new song in their heart, a song of praise. He gives us his holiness, and then he says, live it out. Let's take a fuller picture of what that means to us today. And we think about our new song. Sometimes I just think about being in heaven with the angels and singing hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto you, O oh God. Hallelujah. Let us be glad and let us rejoice and give honor to him, the almighty God. I love that picture of worship in heaven, and that's what I want to talk to you today about. We touched on it in the last message about being glad in the word of God in the song of heaven. Is it tells us to be glad and to rejoice and to give honor to him, the almighty God. How do we give honor to him? The God who humbled himself and came, got his hands all dirty, messing with the likes of you and me. The one who sings this great song and then we echo back. And some things that I have just learned recently in my studies, there's a concept in the word of God that comes from the culture in which Jesus was born in the day of the Roman Empire, the Greek and Roman uh, way of living. There's a concept there, and it's often termed as um, patron and client. But I like to use the words beneficiary and benefactor. And I was thinking about that because I was looking up the Word of God, and, and, and he's my benefactor. All my benefits come from him. And the Word of God tells us, forget not thy benefits, to remember and honor the God who daily loads us with benefits. You and I are beneficiaries of things that we do not deserve only because he loved us, only because he's good. He is the benefactor, and we are the beneficiaries. And for those of us who don't 
really get that term if you think about if somebody's got a life insurance policy. Who's the, the beneficiary? Like, I'm the beneficiary on my husband's life insurance policy because we have a relationship. I didn't do anything to earn it, and I don't ever really want to redeem it. <laughs> but the beneficiary just receives because someone else says, I have this, and I want to give it to you. The beneficiary receives. And because we are beneficiaries, of God's blessing. We have a responsibility to respond back that brings glory and honor to him. Let us be glad and let us rejoice and give honor to him, the almighty God. So in the Greek and Roman society in which Jesus was born in the New Testament, the people were very familiar with reciprocity. There wasn't a lot of classes in the, in the community and the culture of that time. There was like the haves and the have-nots. <laughs> but this reciprocity refers to an exchange, a giving back and forth. In the Roman and Greek society, this reciprocity allowed for a bond of favor, a tie that binds, a bond to be established mutually, entered into willingly and freely by both parties. When in the Roman world, a person of wealth and power would accept a, a, a person a client, a beneficiary that was in need in a lower station in life, they guaranteed them with their own character and name. Could you get that for a second? God is guaranteeing you with his own name, with his own character. Like when somebody signs a loan for you on your behalf, God saying, I'm guaranteeing them. And then the beneficiary, they might be very poor and in a very different station of life, and they were in need. And what is the right response if you were in need, Sister Lynn, if you needed a million dollars? Where would I go? <laughs> I'd be in trouble. But just imagine that Sister Summer said, I got you covered. That'd be the beneficiary and the benefactor. So are you going to snub Sister Summers the next time you see her? No. You are going to go out of your way to express your appreciation, and you're going to let people know you're going to give honor to that person, and that's what reciprocity is all about. And this is loaded into the Scripture and the writings of Paul and the church. We honor the great and mighty God who looked down upon us with mercy and gave us what we could never repay. We owe him. Thank you, Jesus. And it's not just a business transaction for you and me in the household of faith. We are adopted daughters. We are made beneficiaries because our Father has engrafted us in and He has put His name and His love upon us. He has written us into the plan. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that He has written me into His plan. Hallelujah. The word grace is incredibly significant even in these contractual deals and reciprocity. They, they both freely enter into a mutual agreement. But once the gift is accepted, and this is a quote from my research, it implies acceptance of the moral obligation to return favor where favor has been shown. If you are accepting the gift of salvation, 
You have a moral obligation to return back to your benefactor. Thanks and favor. Amen? This is how reciprocity played out in the culture. And so when we think about it in our lives today, my proper response, my proper song of the redeemed is to give him honor and praise to the one who continually loads us with benefit. When we receive forgiveness and favor, our response is to offer up ourselves to God's service. Hallelujah. That is your song, your new song, a song only you can sing. Nobody else can sing it. You know, uh, other people can write a song and other people can hop on board and sing it like we, re- we owned it. But only you can live out your redemption song. Only you can sing the song of your redemption. Only you can show back the gratitude and favor that God has given you. When when I first came into church, I had a cassette tape. It was a while ago. (laughs) And I would listen to it, and it was when, I don't know how this technology worked, but I would actually flip the tape. It would play it one way, and I would listen to it at night when I was going to sleep. It was very mellow. But on this project by Cynthia Clausen called Hymn Singer, one of the words, one of the lines of the song has lodged in my spirit for over 30 years. Let the essence of my life be a song that others will want to sing. Let the essence of my life be a song that others will want to sing. You and I are called to live out this holy song of redemption and to live out the beauty of God's grace and goodness. And we do it when we become his hands and his feet. When we do what he did, when we lower ourselves to the point of servitude, the greatest among you is who? The servant. This is a whole new life that he's offered to us, and it turns the world system upside down. We sing this beautiful song when we Show compassion on someone who's hurting. When we go to the funeral home, when we visit the hospital, when we prepare a meal, when we send the text, when we answer the call that we don't want to pick up, when we bake cookies and in the old days, the peanut brittle for the church fundraisers, when we mow the grass, when we have the She's for Christ roll a fawn, when we come to Sunday school prepared and with a baked treat every week for those kids, when we allow ourselves to be interrupted, when we have things that we want to do, when we give ourselves away. When we make time for our devotion and study, when we live out our lives to the glory of God, this is the song of the redeemed. And it's a new song that gives honor to our God who saved us. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that you have the opportunity to sing this song and we can invite others to sing it along. May they see something in you and me, the peace, the joy, the presence of God that causes them to say, hey, I like that song. Teach me that song. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The new song that we need to sing in our world is a song that they've not heard before. Only you 
can sing it. Only you, Norma, can reach your little circle. Only you can reach the people around you. They need you to sing your song. And in this world that is changing so drastically before our eyes, who would have thought that we would be shut down and cannot even cross borders or meet or touch or go to a store? Or, or who ever thought that we would be here? What we need more than ever is to sing the song that the Spirit gives us and be willing to not just serve through giving, but also to be moving with the flow of the Spirit and functioning in the gifts of the Spirit because how else are we going to reach our world? We can't even sometimes invite them. When's the last time you were able to gather for a ladies' event? When was the last time we we don't know what the future holds. And in these days, if we're going to fulfill the great commission, we must be empowered by the Spirit. We must be led by the Spirit. We must say yes when the Spirit prompts us. This is how the great commission will be filled in these days. And this is how your song will be played on the great theater of the world. Our song is a song of hospitality. It's a song of serving. The Apostle Paul wrote that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit all. These movements of the gifts of the Holy Spirit among us, they're given to us as individuals to profit everybody. The original language of this verse tells us that when we manifest God's Spirit, its result is symphero, the Greek word symphony. We join in. The song. We bring our notes, our harmonies, our lives. And there's so much more that we could talk about because I really believe that God wants us to know that because we've been redeemed, we have this obligation, but it's a beautiful obligation and it's an invitation to join with Him and to walk in a new and a living way with Him. One that manifests his presence and moves. He wants more for us than just new life. He wants to give you liberty. He wants you to have a sweet freedom. He offers more than just breath, but he offers a new way of living. Hallelujah. He's authorized us, this great benefactor, for more than just an experience. This is his story. But this is my song. And your life is your song. On a cold day in March of 1820, a little girl named Frances Jane was born in Putnam County, New York. She was a perfectly healthy child, but as babies do, she caught a cold. Colds can be miserable, especially for newborns. Anybody ever had a newborn with a cold? And you know what can happen when you catch a cold. You get those red, swollen, seeping eyes, and that's what happened to tiny little Frances Jane. Her eyes were inflamed and discharging, and there's no cure. You just have to deal with the symptoms and best as you can. And it was said that a poorly trained doctor, I'm sure with every good intention, 
of helping that baby. Used a standard practice to relieve congestion. It was called a mustard poultice. And it's a plaster that's made out of powdered mustard and put on a bandage, and then it's applied to the place that's congested or inflamed. The problem with a mustard poultice is that they can cause significant burns, even first-degree burns. And this doctor put the mustard poultices on the baby's eyes, and her optic nerves were permanently damaged. At six weeks of age, she lost her sight and lived blind for the next 95 years. She was blinded because of a sickness that was no one's fault. She was blinded because somebody tried to help her, but they didn't really know what they were doing. She was blinded through no fault of her own, but she was blinded just the same. Not only was the baby blinded, but her father passed away due to an illness just a few months later. This is a rough situation for anyone. But Frances Jane was born into a household of faith. And that didn't mean that bad things wouldn't happen. Can I get an amen in the house? They did. But they had hope. And when the baby got old enough, Frances Jane's mother and grandmother taught her the words of God. She would memorize long passages of Scripture with her mother and grandmother's help. She would learn up to five chapters in a week. Even as a child, she could rehearse all so complete books of the Bible. It was said the Pentateuch and all the Gospels and several other books as well. Even this child, she could recite and learn so much Scripture. This poor little blind baby victim... She grew up and wrote more than 8,000 hymns. And I just wonder sometimes if we see too much, if we're so distracted, if we can't close ourselves away for just a little while from the distractions and the things around us, what could we compose? What could we see? What could we hear? What could we learn? It was said in one article that she wrote under 200 pen names because she was so concerned that her name would be filling all of the hymn books. You might have heard of her. She became a household name at the end of the 19th century. Her name was Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby wrote the lyrics of a very special song. Sister Jan Tanzel came into church for the first time in over a year. And she said, what are you speaking about today? And I told her the theme, and she said, I have something for you. And she brought me this, not knowing. It's a framed picture of the hymn, Blessed Assurance, by Fanny Crosby. Blessed Assurance. Fanny Crosby wrote those lyrics in 1873. She went to visit a friend and her name was Mrs. Knapp, <laughs> K-N-A-P-P. <laughs> Fanny listened to a song that Sister Mrs. Knapp had um, written on the piano. She said, come and listen to the song. And so she listened to it, but she didn't have any words to it. She'd written the music, but there were no words to it yet. And Fanny listened and when it was over, Mrs. Knapp asked her, what does this tune say? Fanny didn't just answer off the cuff. She got down on her knees and she prayed. But in just a few moments, 
she stood up and she said with confidence, it says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that you can have a blessed assurance no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what hardship you have gone through, no matter what loss you have experienced, that you were innocent or not? Oh, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. And she began to write the words, and they matched along with the music that she'd just heard, the same voice and the same words and lyrics and tune that we sing today. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. But that song of the redeemed. The new song that only you can sing. And as we think about the stories of our lives and the disappointments that could defeat us, or we could choose to rise above and sing our song back to the God who gave us life, who has given us by His Spirit a foretaste of glory. Hallelujah. We have an experience of heaven right here and right now because we were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been born by the Spirit of God and even when life up and downs comes we can hold on to his word and we can mold our response the way that we live out our redemption song to the highs and the lows and the rests and the rushes and the themes and the tones that compose our days. God invites us to embrace the reality that every experience in your life and mine is part of one divine composition. And in every moment, He is with us. Our journeys, we face the peaks and the valleys, but the theme of this great love story is a song of faithfulness. It's a song of his loving kindness, his great benefits continually poured out. And I'm so glad that I can sing the song of the redeemed with you. And I'm so glad that each one of us is uniquely qualified to compose our own song of the, our redemption and share in this beautiful truth of his overarching goodness. And that he can remind us today of how we should be joyful in our Father's house of prayer, regardless of our circumstances. Fanny Crosby said, I've been given a jewel. What was the jewel? She did find love. She married, and she had a child, but the child died. And what was the jewel? What was the treasure of Fanny's heart? She said it in one word, contentment. I don't know about you, but that's a rough word sometimes. <laughs> How do we balance contentment with always wanting more? Because I want more of God, but I'm supposed to be content in him. 
Whatever our situation, we need to be content. In her rhyming way, when she was only eight years old, she wrote these words. Eight years old. Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. We sing Fanny's song, Blessed Assurance, and we appropriate those words for ourselves. But are we willing to sing this song? Are we willing to say, oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot whatever you cannot. Think about it. What is it? If just this, then I could be happy. If just this, if I could just do this, if I could just have that, what is it? Something you cannot or did not get to do or did not get to be. Let's try that song again. Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot fill in the blank. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I cannot, I don't, I don't get to. I just won't. It's time to let go of the hindrances, of the things that we thought that we should have. Fanny continued the song. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my sight. The blind man, woman said, visions of rapture, burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. And this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Even though I didn't get to fill in the blank, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness and lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. 
praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you, Jesus. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy. Because I live in a place where no one else can see but you and me, the visions of rapture that burst in my sight. I see angels descending. I see glory in this place with you. Hallelujah. Being content doesn't mean sitting on your hands and doing nothing. Fanny wrote eight thousand songs. And the melody was written before the words. Like Henry Mancini's love story theme and Fanny's blessed assurance, God's song he's started and he's asked us to join. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand with me today. And let's just sing that song together. There's something that God wants to minister to your heart through the words of that song. Tyrus, can you play the one with lyrics? James Ireland, I believe it is. Let's just listen and sing the song if you know the words, I know you know the verse, the chorus. Assurance. Jesus is mine. Hallelujah. Oh, what a promise a holy divine. Thank you, Jesus. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Hallelujah. This is my story. I'm going to praise you with how I live, oh God. I'm going to praise you with how I serve, oh God. I'm going to praise you with the words that I speak to my neighbors and my children. I'm going to praise you, oh God, with the song that you've given me to live out through the chorus of my days. This is my song to you, the song of my redemption, honoring you, oh God, all the day long. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, let our souls say yes to everything you ask. Oh, perfect delight. Visions of rapture. From the
Oh, let it be pleasing to your ears, oh God. Holy and acceptable unto you, oh God. May the Lord Jesus Christ receive the song of your life. May it be a sweet fragrance, a sweet melody to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I pray that as you go forward from this place that you will have like Fanny did, a sacred vision that sees beyond circumstance to the glory of the kingdom, the riches, the unsearchable riches, the incredible blessings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. God, I feel challenged and encouraged because you're so worthy, because you're so good, and I want to please you. And I know that my sisters want to please you in the way that we live our lives. And God, in our first service, we talked about your incredible love, and I am thankful for your incredible love. And God, I just pray that you would help us to love you back with our song of redemption, the new song that we sing for your glory to show you our honor, appreciation, our great benefactor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.